Before I begin the story, I want to just uh, acquaint you with a couple of things. This is a picture of Doc Susie at, at her graduation from medical school. And uh, she was about five feet tall, probably weighed uh, 90 pounds, very petite little lady. And uh, she, as you'll see, was quite a, an amazing person. Now this is a, a map of the state of Colorado. This is Denver. And up here, you may not be able to see that black circle, but that black circle is Fraser. And when you go from Denver to Fraser, you have to go over some very, very rugged country, a lot of mountains. This black vertical line is the Continental Divide. The Continental Divide, what's special about that? Do you, what do you think of when it's, well, which way does the water flow on the east side of the Continental Divide? It goes east, out, out toward the Atlantic Ocean. So the water flows uh, this way on the east side, and on the west side of the Continental Divide, it flows out eventually to the Pacific Ocean. So it's a dividing line, literally, uh, and uh, it's a big part of our story. So I wanted you to be sure and understand that. The other thing I wanted to tell you is, this is the chorus to the song that we're going to, I'm going to be singing. Now I want to make sure you can all see, can you all read those words? Okay, I'm going to begin the story by singing that chorus, and then each time we come to it, I'd like you to sing it with me. It's a really a catchy, uh, catchy tune, so I don't think you'll have any problem with it. All right, let's begin. Duck Susie, Duck Susie came by rail one day across the Great Divide to Fraser there to stay to heal herself or meet her end a choice that she had made. She lived to be just ninety, so I guess she made the grade. My uh. <laughs> My life began in uh, a little town in Indiana back in January of 1870. My little brother Johnny was born two years after that, and then a couple years later, my mom and dad were divorced. Dad brought us, Johnny and I, and his parents and moved us to uh, north of Wichita, Kansas, to a farming area, leaving my mother behind, sadly. It was a mixed blessing because I really enjoyed being out on the farm area. I loved taking care of the animals, uh, feeding them, uh, being outside where I could run and play and have a really good time. And it was, uh, it was fun, and every once in a while my grandma, who had come along, uh, on the, on the move, would bring me inside and try to encourage me to learn some domestic skills like cooking and sewing. But I really preferred being out in, in the out of doors. Now my dad wanted to be a doctor, and it didn't happen. And he said, Johnny, I think you're too scatterbrained, but Susie, I think you would make a good doctor. And so I kept that in mind because, well, you just never know. Several years after we were out there, Dad met another woman, and her name was Minnie, and they got married. She wasn't much older than myself, and we didn't get along very well. It was not a good thing, but that's the way it was. And then the whole mining uh, momentum got going in Colorado, and so Dad moved us to Cripple Creek. Finished school, and then Dad had an idea, since Johnny was two years younger than I was, that uh, I should wait to graduate until Johnny was ready to finish and graduate. 
Well, back then, if you finished eighth grade, you could teach elementary school. So that's what I did for those two years while I was waiting for Johnny. Well, then I remember Dad's offer because things weren't going really well for me in, in Cripple Creek. I, I, it just wasn't, wasn't uh, where I belonged. And um, so I decided to take my dad up on the offer of medical school. So I went off to the University of Michigan. I had a wonderful first couple of years. It was, uh, I had a chance to do things I'd never done before. I got to go to plays and musicals and things. And I was a very good student. I learned quickly. I was good with my hands. So I had a, a really good, um, good time. My second year, however, my dad wants me to come back home. Well, why would I want to do that? I never did totally figure that out, but I was able to borrow money from one of my classmates to get me through with the idea that I would pay uh, that money back. Then my senior year, I developed this cough. It, it just wouldn't go away. I, it would wake me up in the night. I would be sweating. I would be dizzy. I would be so tired in the daytime. And it just kept on. And finally, one of the uh, doctors on the staff at the school said, Susie, you've got the lunger disease. You've got tuberculosis. And I thought, oh my, what do I do now? Well, I did finish school and uh, graduated. And sadly, nobody in my family came to my graduation. And I was, didn't have any money. I was in debt to my classmates, so I didn't have any choice but to go back to Cripple Creek. Well, in Cripple Creek in those days, they didn't need doctors. They needed nurses for some strange reason. And uh, I was able to pay back my $500 debt. Uh, but, uh, and then something good did happen. I fell in love with J.R. And we had our wedding date picked and my dress picked out. All of a sudden, he disappeared. I never saw him again. I couldn't imagine what was, what was wrong. And then, as if that wasn't enough, my dad had asked Johnny to come back from uh, his good job as a civil engineer in California and help with the family business. And Johnny came back. He uh, got uh, the flu, the influenza, and that led to uh, pneumonia, and Johnny died. So here were two of the most important people in my life suddenly gone. I just had to get out of Cripple Creek. It just was not the place for me. Well, I had heard that Greeley needed nurses because Greeley was experiencing a diphtheria epidemic. And the hospitals were overrun, and uh, so I went over up to Greeley and was working 12 and 14 hour days. And of course, my tuberculosis wasn't getting any, uh, any better. So I decided there was only one thing left for me to do, and that was to go up to a colder, drier climate and rest. In the year of 1897, a doctor I became. Her health it filled, she had TB. Lunger was its name. Cold, dry hair, it was the cure. So off to Fraser Town. She cured herself of the Lunger name. And then she settled down. Doc Susie, Doc Susie, came by rail one day across the great divide to Fraser there to stay to heal herself or meet her and a choice that she had made she lived to be as 90 so I guess she made the grave I didn't tell anybody but I got on a train from Denver to Fraser. 
by now I had a little dog, a little white fluffy dog named Poochie. So Poochie and I, in boxes of my belongings, got on the train. Now I want to tell you about that stretch. Remember I told you that it was um, over some mountains? This was called, this section was called the Moffat Line, named for David Moffat, who was the uh, superintendent of the railroad at that time. And that railroad went much further beyond uh, Fraser. It was part of the Northwest Pacific Line. Now, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Moffat was very concerned about that stretch because he knew it was very dangerous. And in the winter weather, and I had gotten on in December, it could be subject to avalanches and uh, snowdrifts that would just stop the train. They'd have to bring in men with shovels, hand shovels. They were called diggers, and they would literally dig out the snow. And so you never knew whether the train was going to be delayed or not. Fortunately, it didn't happen the day that I rode it. But the, oh, it was smoky and, and uh, bumpy and, uh, oh, it was quite, quite the trip. But as I got on, the conductor said to me, ma'am, why do you want to go to Fraser? All that's up there are tar paper shacks and lumber mills. But I was determined that this was where I needed to go. Now I had made arrangements for a couple that ran the uh, general store to uh, meet me and help me find a place to live. She took one look at me and she said, Susie, you need to go back to Denver. You look really sick. But I was, I was determined. So they did help, find me, help me find a place to live, and it was right along the railroad tracks. In fact, when the train would go by, everything in my shack would rumble and vibrate. Uh, so it was right there. And then they hired a boy to come in. Uh, my shack had a, a cast iron stove, and they hired a boy to bring in lumber to keep the, the, the stove going and also bring in fresh water every day. And so that's how I began my life in Fraser. And by the time I got settled, I was so tired. I just collapsed on my cot. And I'm sure I slept for two days. But I had a plan. And my plan was, uh, I would go out on a sunny day, even though it was very, very cold, out, pull my cot out, put on all the clothes that I could find, and cover myself with uh, blankets and things, and then maybe put a scarf over my nose and mouth, and breathe that cold, high mountain air. And as I began to feel a little better, I walked a few, just a few steps down to the man who was next door who had a barn and a, and a milk cow. And he would give me a cup of warm milk morning and evening. And I felt that that was going to help me to, uh, to uh, heal myself. So that's how it began. I told no one I was a duck, but Soon the word leaked out. A horse was my first patient of mysteries, no doubt. A twitch was used to calm him down and silence all his groans. She soon was treating everything from cuts to broken bones. Duck Susie, Duck Susie, came by rail one day across the great divide to Fraser there to stay to heal herself or meet her and a choice that she had made she lived to be past 90 so I guess she made the grade Yes, I didn't tell anyone that I was a doctor because I wanted to get well. That was my first job. And as I had said, I made a pact with myself that I was either going to get well or I was going to die in Fraser. Well, it, it, uh, 
as I began to feel better, I was so appreciative to the Werners for uh, helping me get established that I would go down and sometimes help them in the, in the general store. And this one particular day, a cowboy came running in and he was just so upset. He said, oh, oh, somebody's got to help me. Dave, Dave is badly hurt. Well, I couldn't just stand there and, and let that happen. I said, well, bring Dave down to my, my uh, place and I'll take a look at him. He said, I can't, Dave's my horse. So I said, okay, I'll go get my black bag and uh, I'll meet you. You get a big pot of water boiling and we'll see what we can do about Dave. Got down there and Dave was badly cut. He had tangled up with barbed wire and he was really kind of a mess. And I was having trouble getting, well, he tipped over the, the bucket of water and my instruments flew everywhere. And I was having a really hard time getting him settled down. And so the only thing I could think of uh, was to put what they call a twitch on this part of his nose, which you tighten that. And what it does is distract the animal from the real problem. And that was the only way that I could get him taken care of. And so that, that uh, we got uh, Dave settled down. Now, I want to tell you, you know, I was the only doctor up, up in Fraser. I was the only one. And of course, my first patient was a horse. So I played veterinarian. And sometimes I had to be the dentist and hopefully pull the right tooth because if you've ever had a toothache, sometimes you're not sure which one of the teeth is, uh, is the right one. And then I took care of everything that needed to be, needed to be tended to. It was, um, I delivered babies. I took care of broken bones and, and I tried to uh, teach a little nutrition now and then because people didn't seem to have a clue as to what was the right, were the right things to eat. So anything that I need, needed to be done, influenza, the flu, the tuberculosis, I took care of it all. So I wanted to share with you a story, um, a couple of stories. One was about um, Rudy, little four-year-old Rudy. Cute little guy, and I had come to his house because his mother had, I was there to deliver a baby. And you know, you didn't just leave after you delivered the baby, you usually stayed a day or two because you wanted to make sure that everything was going well. And, but I'd heard little, little Ruby, Rudy complain about a, uh, a tummy ache. And so finally I had a minute to take a look at him and looked over here and sure enough the appendix were swollen. And I thought, oh boy, I, I can't take care of that sort of, I can't do that app appendicitis I, surgery, I, I can't do that up here in Fraser. I'm not equipped. So the only reason that the, that we would be able to take care of him would be to get him to Denver to Colorado General Hospital and let some of my doctor friends take a look at him. Well, that meant riding the train, of course, and, if, and it's winter again, and who's gonna take him? Dad couldn't leave mom and the new baby and her other children and uh, all of the things that he needed to be responsible for. So I was the one that needed to take little Rudy. And I was concerned, I was watching his temperature because you know as if uh, an appendix ruptures that poison goes through your whole body and you can die. So it's very serious. And, uh, but I did, we did get on the train and we didn't have any mishaps with the weather and I got him down to Colorado General Hospital and got him taken care of. And that was really, really uh, a blessing. And I see him around here in Fraser now and I think, oh, we did a good job, didn't we? Got him going again. But the other story I wanted to tell you didn't have as happy an ending. This was about little Agnes Knudsen. Agnes was a year old when I was called in to look at her and she was dying. She was dying of something called scurvy. We don't hear about scurvy anymore, you know, it's that Disease, uh, d disease that is controlled by your diet, plenty of vitamin C, and, and you don't have scurvy. But uh, her parents were Swedish, they didn't speak English, and dad was very proud, and he 
knew he didn't have enough money to pay me, and by the, back then I was charging like 25 cents for a call, but um, by the time I was called, this baby was dying, and I watched her die in her mother's arms. And it was very, very sad. And mom was pregnant again, and I said to that dad, now look, when it's getting time for her to have this baby, you get her to me, or I come to you. You let me know. And if you don't uh, do that, and there's a problem, I'm going to have you committed to a prison for murder. I was that upset with, with the whole situation. Now, I had an experience, um, what was, I found out what it was like to be lonely up in a place like Fraser. Uh, I uh, had gone out on a house call, it was night, and let me tell you, in Fraser at night, it's dark. You can't see anything. And um, so I was coming back from this house call and got home and discovered that Poochie was gone. Well, where had Poochie gone? So I got a hold of a couple neighbors and I said, let's each go out a different direction and see if we can find Poochie. So I start out and the next thing I know, I'm falling into this pit that had been dug, crashing against the side of this thing, breaking, uh, I knew I was breaking ribs and oh, it hurt, it was horrendous. And I started screaming. I thought, who's going to hear me out here? And just hoped that somebody would, would uh, f figure out that I was in big trouble. Well, after what seemed like forever, here comes one of the men that had gone out to look for Poochie, carrying Poochie under his arm. And Poochie was just fine. I was the one that wasn't fine. And uh, I found out what, what it was like to uh, be, have a problem and, get, and be lonely. It can be a, a, a real problem in a community like that. You know, the men go off to work and they are busy long days and they uh, come home, they have supper and they go to bed and they get up the next morning and it's the same thing all over again. The children are out playing or going to school, but the women, it gets kind of lonesome for them. So I found out what loneliness was all about. My shack called home, it was torn down, was on the right of way. The twins and, and Fiend and Dane, the Swedes and Finns and Danes, spread a barn for me to stay. That barn called home, it was a place for me to work and play. They had a dance to celebrate that glorious moving day. Duck Susie, Duck Susie came by rail one day across the Great Divide to Fraser there to stay, to hear herself or meet her end, a choice that she had made. She lived to be just 90 so. I guess she made the grade. Yes, um, Mr. Uh, Moffat had passed away, and the new superintendent of the rail line was a Mr. Freeman. And he came knocking at my door one day, and he says, Ma'am, got to take, take down your shock here. It's right on the right of way. We're going to be doing that next spring. Well, my good friend Alex, the Swede that had been so helpful to me in other situations, heard about this and he said, we found a vacant piece of land and the lumber mill is going to give it to you, Susie, a place to put, put a, for something for you to stay in. And uh, we've also found a, uh, uh, a vacant barn, a good sturdy barn, and we can get that moved for you and that'll be your place to, new place to stay. And I thought, well, this sounds like a great idea, uh, but I wanted to have something to say about how this was designed. So uh, I said, I wanted to have a steep roof like they have in Indiana. And you know, that probably was a good thing because the snow up there slide off of a steep roof much better than a flatter one. 
And I said, okay, I want the lower level to be for my patients and the upper level for my uh, place to live. And we're going we're gonna to dig a well inside so I don't have to go out and pump for water. So right in the middle of the lower level, we dug a well. And then I never, I, I never had uh, electricity because I didn't want to bother with that in the cold weather. Because you know, Fraser can get to 50 below in the winter. And uh, so I, I wanted that uh, not to be a problem. So use kerosene lamps and candles. And I had my wood burning stove and I never had a telephone. I had tried having a party line, which was the only choice up there. And well, you don't want everybody on your, on your uh, listening to all the phone calls, especially if it had to do with a health issue. So uh, I got along without a phone, and that's the way it went for all this time. Then, when I got settled, they had this wonderful party. We had uh, a piano player, and we had a guitar, and we had uh, uh, a fiddle, and lots of food. And the new foreman at, the, at one of the lumber mills was named Ben, and he became my partner that evening. And I thought, oh, maybe there's a chance that maybe this might develop into something and maybe I could, you know, might be able to marry him. Well, I found out what gossip was all about, too, up there. The women were saying, does Susie know that Ben is married? Well, that sort of took care of that. By, the, by now, though, I knew that my tuberculosis had healed and I was going to spend the rest of my days in Fraser. A tunnel through the Great Divide replaced the old rail line with its canyon steep and snow so deep the tunnel saved much time. She was a champion of the men and families all around. She was the champion of the men, her praises did resound. Duck Susie, Duck Susie, came by rail one day across the Great Divide to Fraser there to stay. To heal herself or meet her end, a choice that she had made. She lived to be past 90, so I guess she made the grave. Yes, this tunnel project was quite the thing. Mr. Freeman had connections in Denver with the Denver Post and the Rocky Mountain News, and he was able to get the funding to start this six-year project. 1922, they began blasting and moving rock so that they could build this tunnel under the Great Divide. It ended up being 19, 18, 19 feet wide, 24 feet high, and 6.2 miles through. And I'll show you what a difference it made. This pink line is the line for the, tra the, the train from Denver, and you can see it's winding up and up and up across the Great the Continental Divide and over Rawlings Pass, and then down winding into Fraser. It was the long, dangerous trip. The green line is the tunnel. Over here on the Denver side, it's the East Portal, then through uh, the tunnel through the, the uh, Great Divide, Continental Divide, and then over this way through the West Tunnel on toward Fraser, And that was the 6.2 miles. So you can just imagine how much more time and, and the danger that was involved. So this, this was, uh, I was asked to be the uh, tunnel uh, doctor. Uh, there were 19 deaths and quite a few uh, injuries and uh, dust pneumonia was another big thing. 
uh, with all of the uh, excavating and, and going on. And, uh, and then they asked me to be the tunnel coroner also. So sometimes I didn't know whether I was going as the doctor or the coroner when I'd get a call. They also set up a hospital over on the, on the uh, Fraser side, uh, and they hired a, 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 a physician to help with that. So it was, it was quite a project. Now this Mr. Freeman was going to bring all his big buddies for the big day when they were going to ride through the tunnel and they didn't want anybody else being the first to ride through. So we had to continue uh, the old rail line while uh, this big, we were waiting for this big day. So I got my friend Alex uh, on my side and I said, I want you to build me a sign 10 feet high and 20 feet across and on it I wrote we built the tunnel the Denver Post did not and I got together with the ladies in the community and I said let's us carry that sign through the tunnel the day before and get that sign mounted out there so when the big wigs come they'll see it and so we did we walked that 6.2 miles through the tunnel and got the sign up and then walked back. That was quite a, a day for us. And so the big day comes and of course the dignitaries are all smiles and they're having, you know, and then they see the sign and they said, get that sign out of here. It was 20 some years later before anybody found out that I was the one responsible for that sign. So uh, now we had, Fraser had hoped, they, by then the economy wasn't doing real well in Fraser. The lumbering was pretty much over and um, uh, things were getting kind of quiet up there. So Fraser had hoped that the tunnel, uh, the rail through the tunnel would increase the, uh, uh, the economy and stir things up. And it didn't. I guess people just rode right on through and on past. But the surprising thing was that all that rubble that had been piled up became the base for the Winter Park ski area. And Winter Park, the town of Winter Park. So that was a kind of a special surprise. And then I was called to help with some of the injuries that might have occurred at the, uh, at the uh, ski area. I'm in my 70s now, and um, I got this idea that I ought to go back to Indiana. Bundled up box after box. I was kind of a hoarder. I saved every bit of paper, every everything. By now, uh, Poochie has died, so I don't have my little dog. But all my boxes and I get on a train and go back to Indiana. Three weeks later, I'm on my way back to Fraser. I didn't belong in Indiana. I didn't know anybody. The, the, the taxes were too high. Cost of living was, I didn't belong. So I came back to Fraser and spent a, a few more years, uh, more quiet years, but then my, my, my Denver friends, my doctor friends said, Fra uh, Fraser really isn't the place for you anymore, Susie. You need to come down now to a lower elevation. And uh, so, <laughs> Doc Fraser left old, Doc Susie left old Fraser after time and many tears. She doctored in Grant County for 47 years. She passed away in Denver at 90 years of age. Today she lies in Cripple Creek. She made the history pay. Duck Susie, Duck Susie came by rail one day across the Great Divide to Fraser there to stay to heal herself or meet her end a choice that she had made she lived to be just 90 so I guess she made the grade 
And that's the Doc Susie story. <laughs> 27 years after she passed away, she was inducted into the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame. So, uh, and, uh, and at the entrance to Fraser, there is a statue about eight feet tall, I understand, much taller than she is. Uh, that welcomes you into Fraser. I don't know whether uh, you've seen that or not. <laughs> yes, and the place that she grew up, uh, excuse me, the place that she had as her, her place uh, is now a private residence, still being occupied. The barn. The barn, yes, yeah. And um, then her, uh, she was buried in Cripple Creek. There was a family plot and um, uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a story. Uh, do any of you have, uh, now th these people lived in Fraser. so what, in what years? 1974 through 78. Uh -huh. But you know, this story brings so many smiles because a hundred years later, it was not much different than when she first came here. We still had party line telephones. <laughs> The, when you were saying about snow, it gets 30 feet of snow a year. Um, the temperatures are minor, minus 50 below. And uh, when the nights are so dark, we were driving home uh, one night and we were coming around the corner and all of a sudden we see these two lights going up into the sky. There's really nothing out there, so we can't figure out what it is. And two, uh, it was Friday or Saturday night, and the two good old boys that had too much down the old grand in and they gone down a embankment backwards in their pickup truck and the headlights ah. stick up in the sky. We stopped and are you guys okay? Because it's like so cool, we can't pass this Rex by. And they're like, yeah, we're okay, we're okay. They were fueled from in within. But, huh? That story brought out so many memories. I had uh, oh also Fraser mentioned the story that Fraser Mercantile, which was built in like 1906 or 1916. It was still there last time we went through it. It's right on Highway 40 there. It's just an old, things old kind of uh, yeah, crenellated roof uh, front storefronts and still uh, a uh, general store. And so About how many families would you guess when you were there? That well, Well, I had a, an opportunity to meet someone by the name of Owen Briggs, who uh, knew Aunt, uh, Doc Susie. He's now in his late 80s. Um, and I'll show you, whoops. Um, the reason he knew her is that his aunt was a neighbor of Doc Susie's. And he, he does a program on uh, uh, her life too. In fact, he stepped on a rusty nail and she took care of him at one point. But he, he lives over in Penrose, uh, in uh, Canyon City. Oh, so that's the, from their newspaper? Uh, it looks like this. They're up in the caption there with the newspaper name. Catch it. Uh, uh, the Daily Record? 
That's, that's the Canyon's yeah. newspaper, yeah. Anyway, he's a very nice man and he's interesting and he's got memorabilia that he doesn't know what to do with because, uh, you know, he's now in his late 80s and uh, it's one of those, some of the, her things are scattered in, in two or three different places and not enough to have a big museum all of its own uh, or the monetary wherewithal to create that but um, there, is, there, there are things that I'm sure would be of interest. One more thing that I thought was really interesting about her, she carried uh, three unusual, you might say unusual things in her case, in addition to stethoscope and, and uh, so on. She carried a bell because she was, concerned about mountain lions. And you know, she would be out, sometimes, she, she, well, walking three and four miles out by herself in all kinds of weather, at all kinds of different times of the year. Maybe she was skiing to get to where she needed to go, but she would go to all these places, you see. They would, not many of them came to her place. So she had a bell, and then she um, always carried her Bible with her in the, bag, in the bag, and she marked it with a, with a bird feather. And then I haven't put this in my bag, but she also carried a 38 pistol. <laughs> and she let people know that she was a very good shot. And if need be, she would use it. And uh, so there you have it. She was very frugal. She would reuse bandages, rewash them and iron them, reuse them. She would sharpen the needles on her syringe. All kinds of interesting little quirks. And you know, probably living up there you would develop some quirks after a while, after 47 years. <laughs> so anyway, I found her to be a very, very uh, interesting lady. And uh, so, yes? Well, it sounds like she didn't make too much money at first, so how did she survive? She really, she, she never owned very much of anything. She never had much. Uh, her needs were simple. Um, she never had a car, she never owned a horse. Uh, she bartered a lot. And one of the things that she would often do would be um, around dinner time, she'd just sort of show up at somebody's house for dinner. <laughs> but this was her social life, you know? I mean, she didn't like to cook. So she would just show up and, and uh, be there for dinner. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, she, was, she really had very few material uh, possessions. Uh, she was highly respected by the doctors in Denver because she had no testing equipment up there. She didn't have an x-ray machine, she didn't have anything. And they really admired her for her diagnostic skills. She was very, um, very, very good. So, anything else? Well, thank you for coming, appreciate it.